Hi everyone, that's two o'clock. I think we'll just make a start. I'd like to welcome you to this session of SLF this afternoon with uh, Duncan Rigg Secondary School. My name is Paul Morgan. I'm a Senior Education Officer with Education Scotland. Um, before we start, you'll see on the screen there that there's just a protocol slide that you may have seen in other sessions already, but uh, I won't read through everything there that's on that slide, but just to pick out a couple of main points to cover before we start proper. Um, can you please make sure that your microphone is turned off uh, when not speaking in order to avoid any background interference? Um, you're encouraged to use the chat pane to make a comment uh, to anything that you hear throughout the, the presentation, throughout the session, or to ask a question. Um, and hopefully there will be time at the end um, that's factored in to, to address those questions. And you can also use the chat pane just if you're experiencing any technical difficulties as well. Um, please let us know about that and we'll get some, some help to you, hopefully. Um, also, this year's Scottish Learning Festival sessions are all being recorded, so you might wish to switch off your camera if, if you don't want to appear in the, in the recording. Um, I'll now hand over to Chris Collins, the Deputy Head Teacher at uh, Duncan Rigg Secondary in South Lanarkshire, who will give more information about today's session and introduce his colleagues to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you find this session uh, very useful about a whole school approach to literacy. Uh, as Paul said, my name is Chris Collins. I'm the deputy in charge of literacy at Duncan Rigg Secondary School, which is in South Lanarkshire. And presenting today are Jonathan Grant, who is our principal teacher of literacy, and Joe Whiteford, who was our principal teacher of English. The presentation will be in two parts. Uh, Jonathan will first discuss the uh, disciplinary literacy element of uh, our course and programmes, and then it'll move on to Jo, and she will discuss the literacy interventions. Uh, Duncan Rigg says in South Lanarkshire, it's a big school of 1,700 pupils, and th these are the kind of things that we have done over the last years that have worked for us. Uh, like uh, Dylan says, something works everywhere and everything works somewhere, but we think that this is a robust programme that will, will be useful for you if you're looking at improving literacy in your school context. So what we'll do now is I'll hand over to Jonathan and he'll take you through the first part of the presentation. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Chris, um, for that introduction. Afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, as you said earlier, my name is Jonathan Grant. And until earlier this year, I was the principal teacher of literacy here at Duncan Rigg Secondary in East Kilbride. Um, this afternoon, we'll be discussing a whole school approach to prioritising literacy across the curriculum. And uh, Joe and I will really be taking a twin track or explaining our twin track approach, which goes through disciplinary literacy for all teachers across all subjects, and then the intervention work of reciprocal reading. Um, so, uh, unlike many literacy PTs, I'm not an English teacher. My subject is modern studies and I teach a few other social subjects as well. Now, even during my NQT year, it quickly became clear to me that the pupils who were doing well in my subject were doing well because their literacy was strong. And those who were struggling a little bit were likely to be struggling because their literacy was weaker. It was much more about reading comprehension and written expression than it was about understanding of politics or any other content knowledge. So to give you an example of that, I was recently reminded that in one of our National Five exams, the kids were asked to explain how crime impacts upon or affects the perpetrators of crime. <laughs> And that slightly more sophisticated word perpetrators sort of stuck out a little bit. It is in the course specification. But one girl, this is about five years ago now, one girl in my class after the exam said to me that she didn't know what the word uh, perpetrators meant, so she just guessed and wrote about victims. She had the knowledge required to answer the question. She'd have been fine if the question asked about offenders or criminals. But because she didn't have that slightly more sophisticated word in her vocabulary, she actually missed out on six marks in a summative assessment. 
So that's just one example. But that realization about literacy is what led me to take on the PT literacy role at Duncan Rigg and really start to think about how to embed literacy across the curriculum and make that idea of responsibility of all make that into reality. Two more quick points just on the importance of literacy in secondary schools. And the first is on the question of attainment. Uh, a recent study uh, from 2020 found that the correlation between weaker literacy and poor GCSE attainment, this was a study undertaken in England, was stronger in geography, maths, history and science than it was in English literature. Um, so this is something that is lots of CPD sessions and CLPL sessions and whole staff meetings and departmental meetings that we shared and repeated fairly often with staff to underline the point that literacy is not just something for the English department. We all want to raise attainment, to maximize attainment. Our pupils want to thrive in the senior phase. And I think studies like this one, and there are others too, but studies like this one show that literacy is the bedrock of attainment in secondary schools. Another study here comes from Edward Sosu and Sue Ellis's work from 2014, and it shows us that visible sort of attainment gap in reading specifically. So we can see that literacy can be understood as a social justice and equity question too. We can be confident that if anyone out there is a PEF principal teacher or an equity lead, that literacy is certainly something for them to consider. Every young person, I believe, has the right to read and the right to learn. Very often that learning takes place through mediums of reading, writing, talking and listening. In school, certainly, but also in the, in the world beyond. Now we do work on, I'm sitting in our, in our really fabulous library here, we do a lot of work on reading for enjoyment and reading for enjoyment enriches our lives. But literacy greases the wheels of employment, lifelong learning, navigating public services, every single form of communication. Now, I'm not going to claim that through literacy, we can, through literacy or vocabulary alone, we can close the attainment gap, but we will help individual children in our care by enhancing this universally valuable skill. As teachers, we are all, almost by definition, highly literate and articulate people. And we owe it to the next generation to pass those skills on and to share our own gifts as widely as possible. We owe it to every pupil, but I think, and I think this graph alludes to that, that we especially owe it to those for whom better literacy could mean a transformational improvement in life chances. So what did we actually do here at Duncan Rick? Well, we began with explicit vocabulary instruction. Uh, that was back in 2018 when former head teacher popped a copy of Quigley's Closing the Vocabulary Gap in My Tray. Another couple of texts we used there as well, um, like the Research Ed Guide to Literacy and Catherine Mortimer's Disciplinary Literacy and Explicit Vocabulary Teaching. But we felt that, and this is at the outset of our journey, we felt that vocabulary was the, was the clearest and best access point for literacy for all teachers. We started off, we recruited a working group from across the curriculum. Uh, and this was a first almost symbolic step. We wanted staff from every subject. Jonathan, sorry, I think you've muted yourself. We can't, we've stopped being able to hear you, I'm afraid. How's, how's that now? That's, that's great, yeah, thanks. Could you hear me at all? Just for about 20 seconds there. I okay, think I just that's assumed fine. It was my that's connection, good. but it, yeah, brilliant. Okay, thanks. that's fine, thank you. And let me know if that happens again, Paul, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so we recruited a working group from across the curriculum. The idea was that we had, teachers from out with the English department seem to be working on literacy and representing and demonstrating, not just saying, but demonstrating that literacy is the responsibility of all. So we had historians, biologists, physicists, home economists, PE, IT, DET, all of them visibly involved. And, all, and each member liaised with their own department 
fed research and ideas back to their own departmental teams and faculties and took responsibility for their own department's input. And that input took the form of some things like word of the week activities, what I'm reading posters, family learning events after school. That became the the day-to-day work and business of the of the literacy group but for this seminar i think the most pertinent or the most relevant activity was our vocabulary uh, clpl so in collegiate time after school we each delivered a workshop on a specific teaching idea this is still back um, at the early stages and those ideas might include things like the freer vocabulary model the use of academic speech and language in the classroom vocabulary retrieval games um, or things like er- using etymology and morphology we used a google form sign up sheet for that kept it very simple and we let teachers from across the curriculum choose their own workshops and in providing that clpl we stuck doggedly to the idea of practicality because teachers are as all of us know very busy people every session had to be low effort for attendees and high utility. We gave every teacher ideas and resources that they could pick up and use in their classrooms the next day. We we, we wanted to make sure that we weren't adding to people's workloads, but rather where possible, reducing workloads by providing resources. Everything was shared on a Google site on Glow that we could all access so that teachers had immediate access to vocabulary starter, main and plenary tasks for their lessons. And this idea, this mantra, if you like, of practicality was absolutely crucial because it meant that vocabulary instruction became a part of the school's pedagogical routines. By keeping it practical, we made sure that this CLPL had an impact, had an effect, that what we were proposing was used in classrooms. It wasn't just one of many sessions that ends up forgotten after it was finished. We wanted it to be pick up and go, useful and practical. Uh, We did do some anonymous follow-up surveys after uh, after these events, and the response from teachers was overwhelmingly positive. Something like 85% said it was the most valuable in-house CLPL that they'd had. And I think we had that success because, like me at the start of my career, secondary teachers can see and feel the need for good literacy instruction in their subjects and that that goes that 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 rings true in every subject and ultimately good literacy teaching is just good teaching the freer vocabulary model to give you one example lets you teach content as well as literacy uh, the one of the historians on our working group used communism as his exemplar word as he was demonstrating that that just that one technique. And in that case, the line between literacy instruction and just teaching history content, historical knowledge, is quite blurry, if it exists at all. Good literacy teaching is just good teaching. So teachers know that we aren't reinventing the wheel or presenting a fad. We're equipping subject specialists with the tools they need to do their jobs well. And I think for anyone who's SLT or a literacy leader, that is how we can present this to our teams, not as some kind of additional burden. You need to think about this, about literacy on top of anything else, but rather here are some resources and an approach to pedagogy that will get results for the kids who need results the most. And it doesn't hurt that we're doing the socially just thing at the same time, because I think all of us in this profession do have a strong sense of justice, and that's something that spurs us on. So um, with that foundation established through vocabulary, we moved on to disciplinary literacy for a deeper understanding of how literacy manifests itself in every discipline. So disciplinary literacy, um, the main guidance comes from the Education Endowment Foundation, and we can see it on the screen here and from that graphic that they've produced. It recognizes that literacy skills are both general and subject specific, and it asks teachers to question and consider how literacy manifests itself in each subject discipline. Um, So again, in 
collegiate time, now into post-pandemic 2021, we asked departmental teams to complete these templates on vocabulary, reading and writing. And this was an efficient way, that's history and maths we can see there, um, an efficient way for teachers to meaningfully discuss literacy in their own subjects. Um, but it did require a little bit of preparatory work for myself and the rest of us on the literacy team. First of all, I took on the job of making those templates myself and sharing them on Google. It was useful to have a consistent look. We can see through across three different subjects there, a consistent look across the school, which demonstrates that we're, we're all following the same pattern. We're all following the same policy. But more importantly, myself working on these templates was vital because it took formatting and hassle out of teachers' way and maximise the time they had to actually talk and think about literacy in their subject, because that was the point. This wasn't a quick or a tick box exercise, but rather an opportunity for subject specialists to really think about and discuss the literacy of their discipline. All the research, or a lot of research out there at the moment, says that we've got an impediment in Scottish education, which is time not contact time, time in teams to talk and think about curriculum and pedagogy and literacy. So as part of this activity, we sought to really carve out that time for teachers to talk and think about this really crucial part of teaching. And I would again, and I think Chris will touch on this later on, but I would give some thanks to the SLT there for backing us up and providing that time in in-service days and, and collegiate time, because without that support, um, we, would have, we would really have struggled. Uh, secondly, I met with all PTs and faculty heads in advance so that they were ready to lead discussions with their own teams. And again, the literacy group and I tried to take as much um, of the work away as possible because the PTs and faculty heads are, we all know, extremely busy. If your literacy initiative is going to work, it can't add to people's workloads. If possible, it should reduce them by providing resources. And then either during or after the collegiate time, I visited every department, so did a couple of other members of the team uh, to support them. In some cases, I had a quick look at the work they'd done here. In other cases, I did a little bit more to almost co-construct the understanding of literacy and find examples of key vocabulary. You'll see there that these are, maybe you can tell, they're up on the walls in Duncan Rig. We had them printed on durable, high quality boards, which were then mounted in corridors. And there were really two purposes to these permanent displays. Number one, these act as artifacts. They demonstrate that we value literacy and we understand the prominence and the importance of literacy in every single subject, including maths, including computing science, everywhere. But two, the, these displays give pupils practical information on vocabulary, reading and writing in each subject discipline. Pupils will see these walking down the corridors they're in classrooms, so they have actually a practical use too. So we've got symbolic value and a practical value to that, to that work, to those boards and that activity. Uh, on the end service day, we, all, we then spent some time developing our own pedagogies on literacy. Now, part of this was informed by reading age data, which Joe will discuss in a little bit more depth in a wee while. Um, and we also used some recent literature, as you can see there, the quotations from people like Alex Quigley and Catherine Mortimer. Um, where possible, we provided subject specific guidance, like these extracts that are on the screen and they are specifically written for math teachers. But we also spent a lot of time working, teachers of all subjects spent a lot of time working on it themselves and thinking about how best to approach literacy because there's a limit to what I or Joe or Chris can really do because disciplinary literacy depends on teachers bringing their specialist knowledge to the table. If we go back to that tree graphic, it's the idea of read like a geographer or debate like an historian. Um, it depends and it's rooted in the subject knowledge. So again, the time was essential because it let teachers take ownership of literacy in their own departments and their own classrooms. That time was also about how we support weaker readers or struggling readers in each classroom, how we can differentiate and scaffold so that those pupils can access content knowledge and skills across the curriculum. We shared the recommendations that come with pupils' uh, reading age reports. Again, Joe will go into a little more depth on that. And we gave teachers the opportunity to think about how to help the, 
the specific kids in front of them with that extra knowledge about their reading ability. We even included statements and quotations from pupils themselves about their experiences of literacy in all classrooms, because hearing from the pupils, as we know, I think from a few um, seminars this conference, is often very, very impactful and more impactful than anything we can say ourselves. So just to summarise, uh, our working group number one led by example with a visible presence from every subject, not just English. We took a research informed approach to vo explicit vocabulary instruction. We provided practical do this tomorrow CLPL. We followed the Education Endowment Foundation's disciplinary literacy template. We carved out time for teams to talk to each other about how literacy manifests itself in their subject areas and having a supportive SLT was crucial in providing that time. And we equip teachers with this, the information and tools they need to help struggling readers access every subject and promote equity. So with that focus on supporting struggling readers, that leads us ne neatly on to the next part of our session. So I'll pass you over to Joe Whiteford, Principal Teacher of English. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I wish we'd managed to have a slightly more seamless handover than that, but um, I'll ju just get going. My name is Jo Whiteford and um, I've been the principal teacher of English at Duncan Rigg for the last nine years. So it falls to me to um, give you a little bit of a tour of the specific literacy interventions that we un have undertaken. Um, in this twin track, disciplinary literacy running on one track and literacy interventions running on the other. I think it's quite helpful um, to give you some background for the impetus for these interventions. I think most of us probably um, in this meeting today are aware for the need for literacy interventions. For most of us, we didn't need data to know this. Um, and that, that's very much been part of my journey is the role that data plays um, in supporting people's learning. Um, but we know that colleagues in every discipline are increasingly aware of pupils with concerningly poor literacy skills. For us, the journey began way back in 2017, when it became apparent that we were expecting a, a substantial cohort of pupils who were still working um, in the first level in reading. Back then, the judgments that we made um, were purely qualitative. Um, we looked at the primary reports and we based our decisions on how the children were getting on in English classes. Um, and that was really about it. And so in our first year, we ran three big reciprocal reading groups with 10 pupils in them that focused on the four key reading skills. It was an English department only initiative. I mean, basically, I, I did it with our school librarian. And um, we negotiated a wee bit of PEF funding so that our school librarian, uh, Louise could work a few more hours and thus support um, the admin of those groups um, and the running of those groups. And I'll come back to that role a bit later because without that, I, I, I don't think we could have done this at all because there, there is a level of administration that's required um, in these groups and some other really important things. And as it says on the screen, ethos um, was really important. It was one of the main aims of the initiative and the pilot. We wanted pupils to feel safe and to feel seen in the English department. Uh, and, and from that, we began to see a benefit almost immediately because high quality relationships were formed with the principal teacher of English and also with the school librarian. And so these children who found reading difficult suddenly felt the power of unconditional positive regard. They saw both the library and the English department as a whole as a place of acceptance. It was also important for them that there was a really straightforward, truthful acknowledgement that reading is hard. Um, and that meant that they knew they were not alone because they were in a group with a whole bunch of other children who also found reading hard. Um, the reciprocal reading strategy was also really effective, though, in terms of attainment. It's not just all the touchy-feely stuff, the warm fuzzies, um, because pupils we found from our own English department data could use the four skills. They could predict, they could question, they could summarise, they could clarify unfamiliar vocabulary. They made progress in English assessments um, and were more confident in other subjects. So that, that was anecdotal. We would survey them and get evaluations from them of how they felt they were getting on at that stage. 
Um, and so positive results were found. I'm going to give you a very brief um, overview of reciprocal reading because um, I'm sure some of you know lots about it already and it also could be an entire seminar um, in its own right. So it's not new. Um, the, the picture of the book on the screen is um, 12 years old. Um, it's Laurie Oscus, second edition, Reciprocal Teaching at Work, um, that was published in 2010. But the original research goes back way, uh, way back to the 1980s. And the basic premise is that children need four skills to become competent readers. And those four skills are displayed along the bottom of the screen. Um, it's a very well-established program, but I think its strength um, comes in its flexibility. Um, I'm going to put on the screen the things that we found to be the non-negotiables um, and the things that have worked for us in our situation. Firstly, use the think aloud. So that really does what it says. You, as the leader of the group, think aloud. You share a deconstructed thought process of what you are doing while you're reading with the group. Um, the group have some sentence stems and starters that allow them to start, as Jonathan said earlier, you know, talking, talking like a reader um, and expressing their answers using these stems is really, really helpful. You model for them what goes through your head as an able reader. Secondly, you talk about the skills, predict, question, clarify, summarise all the time. Um, you articulate which skill it is that you're using at that moment. Um, I think it's helpful to know that these skills um, match our outcomes and experiences really, really well. Some of the literacy skills that I think, um, certainly as English teachers, we find quite hard to assess and put in even as an experience into the curriculum. Using reciprocal strategies, I think, really enable you to do that very effectively. Thirdly, Participation. Um, I think some people struggle with this because you have to insist on verbal participation. Everyone has to give answers and, and that can work for very, very shy children by allowing them to agree with somebody else. But it's so important that voices are heard and that everybody's voice matters. And um, for some of the children with very poor literacy skills, their voice has not been heard in a learning context. Um, and I think it's absolutely crucial to have that underpinning what we're doing. Fourthly, pace. I'll probably talk about pace again a little bit later. Pace is very much slower than it is in a classroom. Um, I think when you first start using reciprocal skills, you probably go too fast. Um, you'll be astonished at what pupils are not picking up at normal classroom speed. And finally, this is labour intensive. I've already alluded to the role of our librarian, Louise. At the moment, although I said we started with groups of 10, it, they were far too big. We now work on a two staff to six pupils ratio. Uh, and we found that to be the, the kind of um, optimum ratio. I think as, as teachers, we like to all believe that we've got a class of 30 in front of us and we know exactly what's happening in every corner of the room. Uh, doing reading interventions has proven that that is just not the case. Um, having a second pair of eyes who, from a person who's, who's not there to deliver anything, who's not there to take the content forward, um, reveals how much we miss as the teachers and also who we leave behind. Um, and in a group of six, the whole point is that we're not leaving them behind. So Louise keeps the pupils on track. She, and that can be as simple as showing them exactly where we are on the page, because one of the things that you do when you're reading a book reciprocally is that every time you turn the page, you say we're now at the beginning of page 22. But even with a tiny lapse of concentration, a child with poor reading skills has no idea where to find where we are on the page, can't catch up, can't scan quickly enough to make that happen. Louise can just really gently point them to where they are. She also just can prompt them to get back on track, remind them they've got their reading ruler, remind them they've got their overlay to check where they are. 
She also is great when I'm getting responses because she quite often will team up with the timid. Um, and it's a lovely thing to see because it gives them confidence because they know they've got um, a supporter by their side. And it's really essential for making those groups a very sp safe space from which children can make massive improvements. We learned all of this over the course of two years. So where next? Um, we had a new head teacher by this point who initially wanted to move all literacy interventions, specifically Reading Wise, which is a, a programme you may have heard of. It's based on a, a Chromebook. Children um, uh, log on by themselves and it's a decoding and phonics programme that they work on individually at their own pace. Um, and, and we really resisted this at the beginning um, because we knew that something really wonderful was happening with reciprocal reading um, and the group dynamic that was created by a very highly consistent approach. So we made our case and we were allowed to continue with a twin approach. So pupils had some reading wise time and they also stayed part of a reading group that sat under the purview of the literacy working group. Um, that Jonathan alluded to earlier. And I knew at that point that we needed data. And this is where, you know, part of my own journey comes in. You know, I knew that, that literacy was bad. We didn't need data for that. But I knew that if we were going to secure um, time, funding and support for this, um, we needed a standardised quantitative measure of success. Um, regardless of the fact that we knew that what we were doing was working. And, you know, I have to confess, this is the classic English teacher approach. Um, and so I needed Jonathan, um, who by this stage was the PT literacy, to drive that forward. And um, we'd started with um, uh, the Nelson test. Again, you might have heard of this. It's a paper and pencil exercise that we put onto a Google form. But it's essentially a set of closed questions, um, closed sentences rather, and a, a, a multiple choice answer. You put in the word that fits best into the sentence and it delivers a notional reading age. We knew we needed something better because um, as a test, it was kind of open to guesswork really. PEF funding was invested in the new group reading test, the NGRT, which Jonathan alluded to earlier. And this is a much more sophisticated program. It's a, an adaptive program and it tests a range of skills so it will deal with comprehension, it will test inference skills, it will even go so far as to test knowledge about language. And this allowed us to be much more precise, not just about our reading age, because it is just a number, but also about which intervention was needed. Probably the most important thing was that it allowed us to share detailed granulated results and remediative strategies with staff back in the classroom. So we were beginning to get this whole picture of staff that were well trained, but also um, having good um, kind of ways, ways to tackle it in the classroom. So our targeted pupil group was about 20% of our cohort by that stage. We prioritised PEF pupils and with those pupils we test them three times a year on the NGRT. And again, all of this is happening on the twin track with staff training. Most pupils are in an intervention group for less than a year. For some, they only need 14 weeks to make the difference. Pupils gain confidence because they've proven their skills in a real context. Staff are informed about what the needs are in their classes. But not just that, they've also been given the tools and the strategies to support those learners. And Jonathan has said that a couple of times is that teaching literacy better just makes us better teachers. So I'm going to show you um, the results slide before I go on to here uh, to more benefits because the first benefit is attainment. Progress has happened so I'm, I'll take my time with this because I know it looks a little bit intimidating with just rows of figures, one of the many reasons that I don't really like data. The, the red block on the left hand side of the screen that you can see is our lowest literacy attainment group. So this group would have done reading wise during their first year. So you can see some of the ages are really alarmingly low and you can see that progress, although it is made, is actually quite slight. I mean, for some of the children, they're making a couple of years of difference, but you can see they're still red, we color code it. 
um, because the progress for these children is slower. They are still learning to read fluently and functionally. And at that level of below the age of eight, we've found that reciprocal reading just is not, is not doing it for them. It doesn't work for them because they're not ready. Um, they would be out of their depth and we've had experience of that, of putting children in to a reciprocal group too soon for social reasons. And it just, it is, it's not the right intervention. They need to become fluent readers, functionally literate before we can start making them really competent readers. The right hand block shows reciprocal readers. Um, and for almost all of those, you can see that substantial progress is made in a relatively short window of time. So the first test on the left hand of the, right, uh, the block is October, November, and then we test them again in February, March. So over the winter in a four, maybe five month period, some of them are making up years of reading time. And you can really see for some of them that there's a switch has been flicked. Do you know, for somebody to go from two years below their reading age of nine years and 10 months to be up at 13 years and five months, there's a switch that has been flicked there. That's not all just reciprocal reading. That's just they've, they've got the skills and now they're flying. They're doing it by themselves. Um, and that's really lovely to see. So to summarize, we are six years in. What are the other, other benefits? Of course, we've had two very disruptive, disrupted COVID years in that. Attainment I've already covered. Learning and teaching. Um, I want to maybe just go back, actually, I'll just go back and talk about attainment a wee bit more, sorry. Um, I looked back at, because we, I said already, we didn't have um, good data for our first cohort. They're now in sixth year. There were 31 of them. Um, and last year, three of them got higher English in their fifth year from first level reading in S1, which I think is an astonishing achievement. 16 of them, an additional 16, are sitting higher English in S6, having done a two-year higher course. An additional two got National 5 last year and have left school. The following year to that, we've got a very similar pattern of success up to National 5 level, which is where we've got them to. Now, these were, as I said, the children that in S1 you could have identified in your class, your mixed ability S1 class, as the children who were going to get to National 4 because they were at first level in reading when you got them in, in S1. Highly unlikely to reach National 5 from that part. More than two thirds of that cohort have reached that level. And we've got very high hopes for the 16 who are planning to sit higher this year. So it's a success story. It also has improved learning and teaching. Reciprocal strategies have really transformed teacher practice, certainly in my department and in the departments of the other teachers who are part of our literacy working group. In the English department, we have reciprocal texts. So we're specifically using them now to promote reading for enjoyment. We focus on the four skills, limited written work is undertaken, um, and the pupils get to enjoy um, a story without you know, innumerable tasks to do. And uh, thirdly, relationships. I've, I said this, this was one of our aims right at the beginning. Um, marked decrease in the number of behavior referrals from the lowest attaining classes. The atmosphere in these classes changed and improved. I'm not going to go so far as to say that they have a positive view of reading, but they don't have a negative view of reading. And that is actually for these children, it's really massive progress. This is the most significant thing that I have done as a teacher. I have taken hundreds of children through National 5 and Higher English over the years. I've dragged hundreds of children towards National 4 um, so that they can get a place in their college course. But this is something much more important than life changing because it opens up the possibilities of the whole curriculum and it opens up the possibilities of the whole world to children through an ability to read competently. And for me, it's where we have to start. And that concludes, I'm gonna hand back to Chris um, to wrap up and do a, a summary for us. Hi there. Uh, thank you to both Joe and Jonathan for that. It was very, very interesting, even though I was there saying it. Uh, a couple of things about context, which we have agreed have kind of helped us on our, our progress towards the, the goals that we've met. Uh, certainly, we have a very supportive local authority, South Lancashire Council. Uh, they were there 
uh, if we needed anything and they were supportive of the actions we're doing. We had considerable sort of professional and pedagogical freedom to try these approaches. Uh, we also had a very supportive head teacher who gave us what we needed from it, uh, which was, if you're looking at implementing it, as time and money. Uh, it needs to be on your school improvement plan. Uh, that means it's formally codified and you will get resources and it needs to be timetabled as well. So the reciprocal reading groups can't be an add-on, they can't be something extra that someone might do. They have to be agreed and timetabled at the start of the year uh, in order that they run, uh, in order that they're effective, in order that the children know where they're going and what they're doing as well. Uh, working with uh, Joe and Jonathan has, has been a pleasure and they're both very capable, but it's it's not something that can be rolled up into the principal teacher of English's job. Uh, they can't take on this as well, particularly in a school as, as large as, as we've got. So having Jonathan there as, as the PET PT to take literacy forward, that was a really a key uh, area of where of what made it successful. Uh, it takes time to build the, the team that you're going to use across all departments. And in that sense, the CLPL and the, st the staff training is, is essential for success. And sometimes people will maybe join the group, but it won't be for them, it won't suit their skill set, or it maybe demands a bit more of them than they thought it would. So selecting the right people certainly has a, a big effect on your chances of success. And when you when it is successful, as Joe has already covered, you, you can get real gains from it. And as she also alluded to as well, you, you can't do it all in one year. It needs to be a three to five year plan. Uh, we were working, we were building up for it for a good few years before we even started that point. So when you're looking at it, when you look at your school improvement plan, you won't get everything you want in the one year. And even if you get a person that's leading it in the one year and you formulate a plan and how you're going to do it, it's certainly a good start and it should lead to the kind of gains that we have seen. Uh, that's my bit finished as well. I don't know if anyone has any questions they want to put in the chat that uh, Joe or Jonathan can answer. We'll also put our contact details up at the end as well. Uh, so if you want to contact us, if you have any questions that occur to you later, please do so. So that's our presentation at an end. Uh, thank you very much for uh, attending it. Thank you very much to Jonathan, Joe and Chris. Um, there's kind of a wee bit coming through in the chat, Chris. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, I've got it there. One wee question. Did support, the support for learning department have a role in reciprocal reading intervention? So, Mr. Grant. Yeah, they absolutely do. And, and we worked very closely with support for learning. And in some ways, we're, we're kind of one layer that is dealing specifically with literacy. Um, we were chatting just before um, we started that actually one of the key members of our team in the early years was one of our learning support teachers. So it's by no means kind of cutting support for learning out. Um, but I think there's a real value in whoever's running it having a really, really consistent approach. And I know that sometimes in support for learning departments, they have to be reactive. They have to respond in a moment, in a period, to a particular need. And sometimes that can kind of get in the way of the, the sort of regularity of a group. Um, so, yeah, no, absolutely. Support for learning, reciprocal reading, it's a match made in heaven. That's great, thanks. I think that was the only question that was there. Yeah. Lots of compliments, but. Yes, thank you very much. I'm sure that everyone listening in will have found that really of, of, of real value and of real practical use, because I think what you've done there is painted a, 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 a picture of how it was really kind of thought through at a strategic level at school and how you've kind of taken it and developed it and overcome the, the barrier. So I think it's um, I think it will be inspiring for others and 
really, really glad that it's recorded <laughs> for others to enjoy and really to kind of pour over. So thank you very much.